Well, thanks for coming back. <laughs> so, let's start. So, the second motivation to study these operators is that they are nice. So, let me tell you what I mean by nice. They are gauge invariant, non-local operators. And, well, some people like gauge invariant things, I guess, because you can measure them and all that. Nobody likes non-local, but, uh, well, I don't know. I like non-local. <laughs> So let me remind you of something, of what a gauge uh, transformation is. So if you have a non-abelian gauge theory, non-abelian gauge theory, uh, with fields in the adjoint, so you have some fields phi that are some like big n by n matrix, where these, like now A and B, are some matrix indices, then a gauge transformation acts as follows. It takes this field, so I will include now the matrix indices, but not uh, anymore. It takes that into some matrix U at the point X, so it's some local transformation, A, A prime, psi, A prime, B, prime, and then U to the minus 1, B prime, B. And this is how gauge transformations act on fields, act on fields transforming in the adjoint representation. So if you wanted to construct gauge invariant operators, one way that is the usual way, would be you take 2 psi x, right, like that, then this could transform with a u and u to the minus 1, and then in order for the u to disappear, you take the trace. So trace of phi x phi x would be a gauge invariant gauge invariant, local operator. Local because it depends just on the point X. Now, let's say uh, that you are a nerd and you insist in having something of the following form, that is psi at the point X and then psi at the point Y. Now, taking the trace wouldn't help anymore because here you have some u, u to the minus 1, but at different points, x and y, and here the same. So this is not gauge invariant. Not gauge invariant. As we will see, what helps us to construct gauge invariant quantities that are similar to that are Wilson lines. So the first question we want to answer is how gauge transformations act on Wilson lines. So gauge transformations on Wilson lines, question we want to answer. Now, let's imagine that we focus in a very small path, so a path that goes from epsilon to, from x to x plus epsilon. Epsilon is a very small displacement, so this, uh, so epsilon mu give us the displacement. Then, the Wilson line, and let me use this convenient notation, from x to x plus epsilon, is equal to the exponential of i, g. Now, as the path is very small, the line integral is very simple, and is epsilon mu times a mu. This is nothing but 
what we call x dot mu. So if x changes between x and x plus epsilon, you can like parameterize. So the path as a function of t is given by x plus t, like x mu plus t epsilon mu, where t runs, let's say, from 0 to 1. So x dot is equal to epsilon, indeed. And remember that this, for a general non-abelian theory, theory, is a matrix. Now, as epsilon is very small, we can expand this. Well, sorry. Let me, let me like that. And this is just one, or rather the identity matrix, plus I, G, epsilon mu, A mu. Right? Just expanding the exponential and keeping the first order in epsilon. Now we can act with a gauge transformation, with a, yeah, with a gauge transformation on this, and what we get, so a gauge transformation, what we get is one plus ig epsilon mu, and we know how gauge transformations act on a mu. I try it to get all the factors right. So basically, I worked backwards and so that I wanted, I had what I wanted to have. So, so this is how a gauge transformation acts on a field a mu. And this is nothing but if you keep the first order in epsilon. u at x plus epsilon times omega x plus epsilon x times u to the minus 1 x. So this is how an infinitesimal Wilson line transform under gauge transformations. You multiply by u of the last point from the left and then u to the minus 1 of the first of the initial point uh, from the right. So this is how, so if you have omega of x plus epsilon x and you apply gauge transformations, that is what you get. That means, now, let's focus in a large path so not an infinitesimal Wilson line, but just the full Wilson line. Now what we can do is if we have like a big path, let's say from x to y, we divide this path in a smaller path, and we write omega of yx as omega of y x n minus 1, Omega xn minus 1, xn minus 2, etc., up to omega of x1, x. Now, we know how each of these little pieces transform under gauge transformations. We just multiply from the left by u and from the right by u to the minus 1. But here, the u to the minus 1 cancels the u of this one. Right? So, is that clear? So, all these, the u's in the middle cancel out, and what you get is that under gauge transformations, this object transform as uy omega of yx u to the minus 1 of x. So, that is how a Wilson line transforms under gauge transformations. Questions? Very good. This is very nice because 
back to our problem of psi x, psi y, we see that we can construct the following gauge invariant operator. So if we have something like trace of psi x, omega of xy, psi y, omega of yx, this is a gauge invariant quantity. And the picture is we have some local field, psi x, and then a Wilson line up to psi y, and then a Wilson line back till psi x. And that is a gauge invariant, nice gauge invariant operator. Uh, okay, so is that clear? A particular case of this is just a Wilson loop. So, if you take the trace of some omega from x0 to x0, so it's like erasing these field insertions, you choose some initial point along the loop, some x0, and then you just compute the Wilson loop. So this is a gauge invariant non-local operator. Now, if you want this to be really gauge invariant, um, and if you take the trace, then x0 doesn't matter. Actually, you would get exactly the same for every initial point along the loop. Actually, if you don't take the trace, x0 matters. And you don't get, actually, you, you get that this guy would transform as a local field a text naught if you didn't take the trace. Because remember that you would have u of x naught and then u to the minus 1. So if you want to get something really gauge invariant, you should take the trace. And then x naught doesn't matter. Okay, so this is the second motivation to study these objects. They are non-local, but they are observable, as we have seen in that experiment, and they are also a uh, gauge invariant. Before we jump to the third application, I am happy to take questions. Okay. The third application is, I guess, one of the powerful uses of uh, Wilson loops is the fact that they help to understand confinement. And we will see now why is that. Like you may have heard many times this that Wilson loops are good to understand confinement, but we will see in the next 15, 20 minutes why this is the case. Uh, now, the idea, so now if we want to understand confinement, we are not going to solve the problem of confinement today, but uh, I will just show you why Wilson loops may be the way. So the idea of this, basically, is to compute the force between two charges, some usually like a quark and an antiquark. So this force will be a function of the distance between the two charges. And the idea is that you try to pull them apart, and either you can't, you can or you can't. And if you can, so if the force decays, there is no confinement. But it may also happen that the force uh, increases linearly with R. So in that case, there is confinement. What we will see is that, quite surprisingly, a Wilson loop can help us to compute this force. So that is what I am going to show you. Any questions on the philosophy? Very good. So now how we do that? Um, Let's start by considering the following problem. So 
So let's consider a path integral the following path integral so we have just a gauge field so it's some integral over these configurations of E and minus the action and we consider this path integral for very long times so from like a very long uh, time in the past till a very long time in the future. So, do you know in this limit, what do you get in the limit of very large times? What survives if you consider the path integral? Usually, the path integral is like some sum over states, and it turns out that if you let time to run a lot, like, you know, like 10 to the 19 to the 37 to the 40 billion years, so something like really, really long, then only the ground state will survive. So this path integral tends to this guy for very large times. In general, there are other states, but other states will have higher energy, so they decay faster. They de decay faster. So now what we want to do uh, and this is a little bit abstract, but we will be more concrete in a second, is we want to add to this path integral add two static charges. So the idea uh, is that now we will have two charges, one, let's say, the electron, and then at a distance r, we will have the anti-electron, something like this, and this, you let them be for very long times. So, if you add these two charges, what you expect, and we will see how to add these two charges, is that the path integral, once you do that, goes to E to the minus, again, the ground energy, but then you have a correction that is the potential due to these two charges. So this is the, partition, the path integral with the two static charges. So we expect for very long times, so here we are assuming that T is much larger than R, we will assume this all the way, so we get that. Now, question. How do we add to this potential two static charges? The way to do that, actually we know how to do that, and what you have to do is you have to add sources to the action. To the action. So basically, if we have an action, and this is pretty general actually, then you have to correct the action by a source term And we are thinking about a source terms that couples to the gauge field. So you have to do that. So basically you have to compute. Now exactly the same path integral, but with the action corrected by these uh, source terms. Now what is the source term? for this configuration, for two static charges. Actually, it's easier to understand it when you see it written. Actually, for these two charges, the source term is equal. Well, first we have the charge on the left. Let's call this left. And the charge left is a charge that is at the origin, let's say, 
right? So it should be proportional to some delta function centered at the origin, so minus zero. Then it's a static. And what that means is that it has component only in the time direction. And then it's proportional to the charge E. Then we have the other static charge, the one on the right. And that one is very much the same, but it's proportional to minus E, so I am putting a minus sign, and it's centered along a distance R. I will be a little bit more precise with this. I am subtracting a scalar from a vector, so you will tell me what are you doing. But basically, it's just like here is the origin, and here is the origin plus R in some direction. And then we have this. This, remember, guy means that the charge is static. That, that is what it means. Times E. So this is the source term for two static charges at a distance R of each other with charges E and minus E. This is very good, actually, because when we plug this back here, and let me see what can I erase. So when you have, let's erase this here. What we get is that this action goes to the action plus IE, and then we will write this guy inserted here in the following way, integral of A mu, and here is for the left, so this is of X left, you know, T dot X mu, well, this is the left, X mu dt plus IE integral of A mu, well, sorry, this dot is not necessary because it's this contraction here, uh, for some X right, T X dot right mu dt. Where, if you want to recover exactly this expression here, what we need to use is the fact that, for instance, x left, so we have to parameterize the path x left, mu is equal to t, 0, 0, 0, and x right, mu, is equal to minus t, because it goes backwards in time, 0, 0, r. And indeed, if you compute x dot, this will have just a component in the zero direction. So indeed, this here will exactly reproduce this delta zero mu. Is this clear? Uh, please stop me if something is not... Uh... All what I am saying is that if you plug this here into the action, you obtain exactly this one here, after you use the fact that x dot, that x is equal to this. So notice, if you compute x dot, x dot is the derivative of x with respect to t, and this is just 1, 0, 0, 0, so you are just keeping the, the, the mu is different from zero in the zero direction. And that's exactly what you wanted for a static charge. So it's this delta zero mu. So it's just that. Now, we are almost done. This is almost, actually, a rectangular Wilson loop. It's, so it's like a line integral for this half, and this, then it's a line integral for this half. Now, since T is very, very large, right, the potential that you compute from it, 
wouldn't change if you close if you sorry if you close this Wilson loop at minus t over two and at t over two. So actually, what we have shown is that S So the action, when we add, so the fact of adding two static charges is adding to the action a term that is proportional to IE and there a contour integral along this rectangular loop of A mu dx mu. Or if you are more comfortable, A mu x dot mu dt. Where this is a contour integral over this rectangular Wilson loop. Okay, this we are actually almost there. So let me let me see what uh, should I erase. So basically what we are saying is the following. So we have two formulas now. We have this formula here, right? So this is just the path integral without the two stat static charges. And then what we are saying is that if we have the path integral with the two static charges, so we have this, in other words, so it's integral over the A of exponential of minus this. Well, here, the signs, let me change the signs of the contour such that you have this, times this exponential. What we are saying is that this, for very large t, should go as e to the minus epsilon zero plus b of r. This is very nice, and this actually here is what we call it the Wilson loop, right, for this rectangular contour. So, we take these two formulas. Again, we use Mathematica to solve for e to the brt, and what we see is that e to the minus brt is equal to 1 over z. So this one, we divide by this just to get rid of this e naught. And then the integral of the a e to the minus the action a with the insertion of this rectangular Wilson loop where the rectangular Wilson loop is defined by this exponential here. Now, this is, by definition, the so-called expectation value of the Wilson loop. In this case, the rectangular Wilson loop. We will compute some expectation values. Uh, So, this is very nice. What we have proven is that the potential, the static potential between two charges is given by the expectation value of the rectangular Wilson loop. So, when you hear somebody telling you that, now you know why this is the case. I think it was it's interesting. Any questions before I proceed? Is it like too abstract or too? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> okay, let's compute some examples because this discussion has as been. One, a, as one question, yes, I think. Absolutely. 
Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you uh, if you could say a little bit more about the fact that you, you have said at the beginning that if you wait uh, enough time, uh, you, only the, the, the ground energy... Right. Okay. So, so ba basically, uh, well, th like, like a, we can discuss a little bit more in the tutorials if you wish, but a, a short, I can give you a short answer. So basically, when you compute this path integral, you are like computing basically some transition between some configuration, let's say a minus t over 2, and then some t over 2, some time t over 2. And actually, in general, this can be written as some sort of sum over states. And in general, what you have is that each term in the sum, these states, you can imagine them as, as states propagating from here to here. So basically, you have some configuration here, then you propagate it up to infinity, and then you annihilate it here. And that's what we are doing here. It's like we are creating two charges at t equals minus infinity. We propagate them, and then at infinity we annihilate them. So you can imagine, so this actually, you can prove that can be written as a sum over the states. This is very similar to the OPE analysis. I don't know if you're familiar with that, of correlation functions. That's actually uh, the same sort of thing. But each uh, state is weighted by the energy of the state times uh, the time that, that you let it. So basically, roughly, re remember that in quantum mechanics, the evolution is e to the minus the Hamiltonian times t, right? If you're evolving at times t. So this would be just this here. So you have for each state, the Hamiltonian would give you the energy of that state. Now, the ground energy is the smallest of all. So it will be the one that decays the less. Um, so for instance, one state will fall off, fall off with like e to the minus t, the other with e to the minus 2t, e to the minus 3t, etc. So if, the, if t is very large, only this term survives. Is that okay? Yeah, I don't have time to give a very rigorous uh, explanation of this. But uh, so, any other question? Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, so I was wondering, why is it that if we introduce uh, gauge invariance at this primitive, so this is, I guess, referring to what we're doing before. Yes, yes. Uh, well, introducing gauge invariance at this primitive stage of the path integral, we get this Wilson loop term. But if we, into, if we enforce gauge invariance later, we, I don't know, I mean, I haven't never seen this Wilson loop term before. The, uh, I, I don't know if I understand the question, excuse me. So basically when we introduce gauge invariance normally in a Lagrangian, yes. we get uh, the kind of standard young males theory and stuff right, like that. Right, so right, no, right, right. But instead if we do it at the primitive stage of the path integral like we did it now, we get this term. So why do we not get this term? Well, I, I think like you, you could describe, actually I think they are like two alternative descriptions of the gauge theory. You could describe them in terms of local fields and all that. And for that, the Lagrangian description is great. Um, uh, or you could actually describe all the dynamics of gauge theory, etc., just in terms of these operators. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. But, but uh, so it's like you can think of like two alternative ways. Also, this uh, is, is, you shouldn't think of this being in the same level as a Lagrangian of the theory. So the Lagrangian of the theory tells you what the theory is. Well, this is like a lot of operators that you can define that depend on the loop. So this is more like the kind of things that you can compute once you are given the Lagrangian. But it's true that if you knew all these loop operators for all loops, etc., you could, you could say that you have understood and solved your theory. Yeah. Well, I, I, but, yeah. Okay. So let's now, in the last 10, 15 minutes, let's like, start computing things. Uh, and we will focus in the easiest of the theories. So I will start today with the computation. We will finish tomorrow. And the easiest of all theories... Well, yeah. That is not like free theory or something like that. It's just pure QED. So that means QED without fermions. So we will study pure 
QED, so we want to compute Wilson loops in pure QED. Uh, pure QED. Let's see how far we get today. Uh, remember that the action for pure QED was equal to minus one quarter, again, in some conventions, d for x of f mu nu, f mu nu. So you have this theory, you have no fermions. Now, let's try to compute uh, for this theory the expectation value of a Wilson loop in general. So, well, so let's see the Lagrangian is minus one four of f mu nu, f mu nu. So let's just compute expectation value of Wilson loops in general in this theory. So what we have to do is we compute the expectation value. So this is just an arbitrary loop. So this is the integral, sorry, the expectation value of the exponential of IE and then an integral along the loop of A mu that depends on the point x of t. This t, remember, parameterizes a point along the loop, t dt. So we want to compute this, right? So this is what we want to compute. Where if you have the loop like that, right? Let's say you could say that this is t equals zero, and then t runs like that. Now, we will, the first, uh, our first tool would be just perturbation theory. What is perturbation theory? It's a Taylor expansion in the coupling constant. So it's just that. So, and this is uh, an abelian theory, very importantly. So this A is just some matrix. It's not a matrix, it's just some number. So, like, if you expand this in powers of E, we get 1 plus the first term, IE, and then the integral along the loop, and you have this expectation value. Uh, is it clear why the expectation value of 1 is 1? Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> this should be kind of clear. Then you have like the expectation value of this guy, right? So basically we are expanding the exponential and then taking the, expo the expectation value of these fields. Where am I? Yeah. Of x dot mu minus e square over 2 integral along the loop of dt1, dt2, the expectation value of a mu of x t1, a mu of x t2, and I'm sorry that I ran it out of, sorry, a mu, a, a nu, and this is an expectation value. I am very sorry about that. This was some, sometimes x dot mu at t1, then like x dot mu at t2, Right? So this is the second order, plus blah, 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 blah. Now, actually, the expectation value of 1 is 1. Can you tell me what the expectation value of a single gauge field is? Sorry? So, zero. Yes, that's true. You could try to compute it. That is something like computing the integral between minus infinity and infinity of x times e to the minus x x squared, and that's zero indeed. The next term that we have is this term there. So it's the expectation value of a gauge field at x times some gauge field at y. Now, this is nothing but the gluon propagator in position space, right? So, by definition, the gluon propagator is the expectation value of these two gauge fields. Now, well, I am using some gauge. You don't have to worry about that. So, this, believe me, 
is given by 1 over 4 pi squared, and then you have a term that is given by 1 over x minus y squared, and then you have delta mu nu. And I'm just using Euclidean uh, for dimensional space. So that is the, the propagator. So now, we don't have to be very imaginative. So what we do is we take this expression and we plug this expression here, right? So what we get, can I erase the propagator? Yeah. So what we get is that the expectation value of the Wilson loop Actually, I have five minutes, but I think we will be able to do an all loop computation, as you will see. So this is one minus e square over two integral over the Wilson loop of dt1, dt2, over the loop, sorry. And then we have one over four pi square. And then you get a term that is x t1 square, sorry, x t1 minus x t2 square. And here, remember that the, this two-point function was proportional to delta mu nu, so that gives you a contraction of the two x dot, right? So this is x dot, sorry, this is t2. So this is x dot at t1 dot x dot at t2, right, plus, etc. So this is up to order epsilon square. In general, you have uh, higher orders, right? So this is just up to epsilon square. It's like a computation. Now, let's say that you like diagrams. I like diagrams. Uh, so this would be equal to the following. 1 is equal to 1 even diagrammatically, then at the next order, we have minus epsilon squared over 2, and then you have your loop, right? So this is supposed to be the same as this. Sorry about that. And then you have a propagator between one point of the loop and the other point of the loop. And then you have to integrate over this point and over this point. Now, the trend is kind of clear. At the next order, actually, again, the three-point function will be zero, but now the four-point function is different from zero. And at the next order, you have that epsilon to the fourth over, let's write this as two factorial, over four factorial times a factor, and this factor I will explain now how to get it, how to get it, but it's three, times the same, but now with two propagators. Plus, etc. What is this three? This three is simply the following. Now, if you have two gauge fields, like a mu and a nu, there is only one way of we contracting them, right? You just contract this with this, and that's it. Now, if you have four fields, let's say A1, A2, A3, A4, there is actually three different ways of contracting it. You can contract this with this and the other two, or this with this and the other two, or this with this and the other two. So this is this factor of three. Now, exercise number two for you guys. The exercise number two is to show, and it's actually not very hard, it's easier than exercise one, is to show that in QED, actually, as these integrals are very easy, and actually this integral here is the square of this integral there. So in QED, just in pure QED, we have 
that this is equal to this square. And this is very nice because actually these three exactly kills the three here, right? And this is equal, so all that expansion is equal to the exponential of minus e squared over 2 times this. For instance, you can see that if you take the square of that, you will get e to the fourth uh, over 4. And, uh, yeah, and you can see that the factors actually do work. Actually, here I just did with this first term, but you can check that all the others work too. And um, so it means, actually, that for QED, the Wilson loop, any Wilson loop, for any loop, the expectation value, is equal to the exponential of minus e squared over 2 times the one loop Wilson loop. And this was integral over dt1, dt2 of 1 over 4 pi square x dot t1 times x dot t2 over x t1 minus x t2 square. And this is to all loops. So we have obtained an all loop result. Okay, it's for pure QED, and no one cares about pure QED, but I do care about pure QED because it's nice. So, and this is actually to all loops. So it's quite something. Of course, if the theory is non abelian, so let me make a final remark. If the theory is non abelian, remember that f mu nu for non abelian theories is the usual d mu a nu minus blah blah blah, but you have a commutator a mu a nu, right? So it means that when you take f mu nu square, there will be a term that will be of this form. So it means that for non abelian theories, you also will have these sort of diagrams. So this is not true, of course, for non abelian theories. It's true just uh, for this abelian theory. And I think it's a good time to, to break here. Thank you. Okay. Are there some questions? Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. So, um, in that, there it seems like there's a, a pole or something when T1 is equal to T2. Um, yes. Seems to make the whole exponential infinite. So you, Absolutely. That's a very, very good point. And actually, we will see in the next lecture, at the very beginning, we will now focus in the rectangular Wilson loop, and we will see that these Wilson loops can have divergences, and we will give a physical explanation for these divergences. Indeed, there could, have, there could be problems when T1 and T2 become equal. And first we will get very worried and sad, then we will understand, and then we will become happy again. Okay. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Right. So before we thank him, and I've got your attention, uh, so again, uh, the bus will leave in about half an hour. You need to get changed or whatever, and perhaps pick up a sandwich, I should say, because obviously it's best to eat before you go skiing, um, unless you want to catch rabbits in the woods. Uh, the other thing is someone reminded me, of course, is there's a poster session, which I've forgotten about. Um, but the, the uh, boards for the po to, put, to put the posters on should be delivered outside here sometime this afternoon. I'm told between 2.30 and 3.00. I don't know. Uh, it's up to you to put things on. And uh, I'm leaving here some pins. Of course, if you run out, which I would doubt, um, you go to the secretariat's office and they'll help you, or if you have any questions. But I leave it to 
to the individual poster people who've all, I think, contacted me to put up their posters, and they will remain for the rest of the school. Uh, they take down Monday, I believe. So let's thank uh, Luke, uh, Fernando once again for a very nice lecture.